Inviting to the Cumberland County Commissioner's Workshop meeting in June 30th, 2016. And please rise and join the Thank you, Legislative Committee. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You can be seated and call this meeting to order at Open the floor for any public comment. Hearing none, seeing none, we'll move on to the agenda. Item number three, uh, Paul and Commissioner DiColibo, Dana Best, and Tim Gender regarding press release and the GFOA Distinguished Budget Presentation Award. This is, by the way, how I know where to sit every day. <laughs> Thanks, Larry. Before I ask Dana and Tammy to come up to receive the award, uh, I think I'll read the press release, which will give folks an idea of what this really is. Today, the Cumberland County Board of Commissioners announced that Cumberland County received the Government Finance Officers Association's GFOA, for short, Distinguished Budget Presentation Award for its 2016 budget. The award represents a significant achievement by the county and reflects the commitment of the governing body and staff to meet the highest principles of governmental budgeting. <coughs> Measures to obtain the budget award include fulfillment of nationally recognized guidelines for effective budget presentation. These guidelines are designed to assess how well an entity's budget serves as a policy document, a financial plan, an operations guide, and a communications device. Budget documents must be rated, quote, proficient in all four categories in the 14 mandatory criteria within those categories to receive the award. This is the ninth year Cumberland County has received the GFOA award. Our county's finance office, the department primarily responsible for the development of the budget document, was presented with a certificate of recognition for the budget presentation. GFOA affirms the award recipients have enhanced efforts to improve the quality of budgeting and provide an excellent example for other governments throughout North America. GFOA represents public finance officials throughout the United States and Canada with approximately 18,700 members who are deeply involved in planning, financing, and implementing governmental operations. GFO, GFOA's Distinguished Budget Presentation Awards Program is the only national awards program in governmental budgeting. So I think this is a heck of an accomplishment by County and our staff. So at this time, I would like for Dana and Tammy to come up and get the award. We're going to bring a couple of lights here if that's okay. Show who we're going to bring a couple of lights here. We're going to bring a couple of lights here. We're going to bring a couple of lights here. We're going to bring a couple of lights here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Remember, it's just hard, so get your paint their individual budgets in the online database. Chris Seacrest designs the cover and the strategy section of the budget. And Tammy Bender leads the budget team and keeps Larry and I straight, which is a big job. <laughs> Tammy, Stephanie, Brandon, and Carrie put a lot of dedicated hours into the budget document and the process is very <coughs> long, but not their only duties. They're also doing accounting and cash management and a lot of other things. So it's about allocating resources and moving things around and getting things done. So they get a lot of kudos for being able to, to deal with all the competing things going on and getting it done timely and in a good manner. And then this year, in some of the overall comments that the reviewers put, there were some comments that stuck out to me. So I really wanted to um, say them because we don't put enough in sometimes. There were three reviewers and all three of them gave really good overviews. Again, what can I say but an excellent in all areas. You can be proud of the fact that I believe you have one of the best budgets I've had the privilege of reviewing. The next one was the separate document budget briefing is superb and hits upon the most important points. Well done. And the last one is overall this budget presentation is an exemplary strategic management plan that will lead the county into the future with confidence and sound financial operational planning. So.
and serving the community presented this 30th day of June 2016. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. Good morning. 
Um, at the end of May, HUD increased the county's home allocation for 2016 by $2,160 um, to a total of $402,489. Um, in accordance with the action plan that you all approved in October of 2015, um, these funds will be used for uh, community housing development organization activity uh, in, within the county. Um, and because this change is less than 15%, it does not require any citizen participation. Um, so no advertising, nothing like that. And so we are requesting that you approve the amended submission allocation to reflect this new allocation. Any questions for Kate on this one? All right, Kate, take it away. We have two items for which action was requested regarding the ESG admin agreements. Uh, both of these items um, relate to the emergency solutions grant contract. As you know, in 2012, 2013, and then again in 2015, the county was awarded funds um, from the DCED for the emergency solutions grant. Um, they do require that agencies administering this grant on behalf of the county be publicly procured. And so with the first award, in 2013, the county awarded a three-year contract to the Redevelopment Authority to administer um, those two grants. And so there are two admin agreements to reflect both of these grants. Um, that admin, though both of those expired this month, and so uh, we are requesting a 90-day extension to both of those uh, through September 30th, 2016, so that the county can issue um, a new RFP and, and re-procure an administrative agency. Keith? Could there be, um, could these both be done in the same motion or do you need separate motions? Separate motions. And, Kate, are you asking the board then to go through the process of a public procurement for the agency yes. to this one? And that will be a third motion. Good. Three for the price of two. Are there any questions for Kate on any of the motions that will be made? Mr. Chairman, if it's in order, I'll make a motion to approve the extension of the May 12, 2014 administrative agreement uh, for an additional 90 days. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Is there a second? Second. All in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Motion carries. <coughs> the motion for the extension of June 14, 2013. I'd also uh, be privileged to make that motion to extend the June 14, 2013 administrative agreement for an additional 90 days. Is there a second? So, all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Motion carries. We need a motion to authorize advertisement of an RFP for ESG administrative services. Is there a motion? I'll make that motion. Second, second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion's carried. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to item 10, contracts and rates, <coughs> and we'll take a look. Thank you, Mary. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to begin this morning uh, with Christine Bowden, who is joining us today via video teleconferencing to discuss the Medicaid grant agreement amendment and the agreement between AD and Community Services and Beverly Crest. Christine? Good morning. Um, the first one for the Title 19 Medicaid is for an extension of one year of the current grant. It was a four-year grant and I'm asking for an extension of one year to continue that grant. Um, the second one is with Beth Chris, who is the RN that approves our assessments that have to be approved by a nurse, have to be reviewed by a nurse. Are there any questions? And, and Beth, the fact that it requires a nurse's approval, that is by statute or by directive from uh, across the river? <laughs> directive from across the river. Thank you. It's Christine. Yes. Anybody else have any other questions? Yeah. Sorry. Thank you, Christine. <laughs> Thank you. Next, I'll call on Lisa Barton, who's five grades for children in the Good morning, Commissioners. I'm here to ask for approval for 15, 16 contracts. Um, the first one is United Methodist Home for Children. They're located right here in Cumberland County. They provide uh, group home services and independent living services. 
They're asking for a 5% uh, increase in their per diem rates. This rate is still well below the average for our group homes that we typically contract with. Um, and it's well below their actual cost to run the program. Their allowable um, approved cost is 255, so we're still coming in well below that rate. Um, the next one is alternative rehab communities. They provide group home and secure services for our juvenile probation kids. They're asking for a 2% increase. The next one is White Deer Run. Um, this one is a new contract set up specifically for a juvenile probation child that nobody in the state will take this child except for this place in a YDC and we get better reimbursement and actually the rate is lower than a YDC. The next one is Concern. Um, one of their foster care, the traditional foster care programs, they're asking for a 10% increase, which is $3.61. That foster care rate is uh, extremely low compared to the rest of the foster care rates we contract with throughout the state. Um, and the rest of their foster care programs, they're not asking for an increase. And then the last one is Edison Court. This was another juvenile probation contract that we established uh, two or three years ago, specifically for a child. They are asking for a 31% uh, increase. This increases in their room and board only, and if we would have um, actually had to pay for treatment, it would typically be a $300 per diem. So $85 is really a lot better than the 300 <laughs> Are there any questions? I know this was probably explained to me earlier, and I forget. Why are the terms of the contract already passed? There's a process the with the state that they have to, the state reviews their budget packets, and once they're approved, they go onto the state website, and that's when we pull them down then and negotiate with the providers. <laughs> And because of the budget impasse, they couldn't start the process until January after the budget was passed. And we still probably have a six to eight more contracts that are for 15, 16 that haven't been approved by the state yet. But these contracts, some of them have rate increases. Mm -hmm. So that means we'll go retro to July one. We try to we're, we're trying to negotiate a zero percent increase because of it being so late if we get to the point where i close my fiscal year books i might ask them to wait to increase the rate till next fiscal year and some of them will agree to that some of them they're providing services for the kids and are there any other questions for me? I, I would just agree with commissioner d mm -hmm. philip it's, it's very unusual in that you know approving contracts retroactive with an increase mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know, I have a little difficulty with that. These are for services already performed. Mm -hmm. And so you're getting paid, you know, you're increasing the amount for the services that have already been performed. Correct. I mean, that, you know, it's, it's kind of unusual. Uh, I, I, would unusual. Just, I would just add, I think there's more of a common cause between us and these providers here both as victim I victims of the state budget impasse. Um, I, I don't think this is any provider's preferred way of doing things and this is the same providers who kept providing services during the budget impasse. So mm -hmm. I don't know I mean that's the way the state government does it and they have control of the process. It it is highly irregular but you know, it's certainly not anything that providers are forced to do. And some of these right providers, here. if they don't agree to it, they might say, you can move your kids and find somebody else to contract with. And then, unfortunately, there's not a lot of providers out there for some of these kids. Well, they certainly deserve uh, adequate compensation based on what they had to endure this past year. So mm -hmm. I don't have a problem with that. It's just. I, I try to negotiate with them to say, can we at least wait to the new fiscal year to move forward? and. They don't always some agree to that. Some, some do and some don't, yeah. Mm -hmm. Keith, is there any legal recourse not here on the table? No. Uh, we've dealt with that issue for years now. Ever since the state process in fiscal year 8 9 when we started. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, hopefully the wrapping things up for right now. I uh, hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, for the
Thank you. Um, next, I'd like to call on Ryan Simon to discuss the first eight agreements, followed by Sylvia Herman discussing the last two agreements for drug and alcohol. Ryan? Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, we'll start with Adler Health Services. Um, Adler Health Services provides uh, outreach activities with in interjection drug users, um, and this is um, the same as last year um, as far as the rate and the total maximum amount on the contract. Next is actually uh, jump part way down to Substance Abuse Services Inc. doing business as the <coughs> project. Uh, this contract is actually for 2015-16 um, year that's currently ending. Um, we just received um, the money from the state to be able to um, enable us to provide this service. Um, it deals with medication assisted treatment um, and the RAISE project um, goes and, and helps drug users with um, the medication assisted treatment and currently they're not getting reimbursed for um, some of the services they provide they rely on donations and the funding from the state that was just approved earlier um, part of that will go towards um, helping them out with this uh, the service that they provide <coughs> Like charities, um, the contract, there's no increase in the rate. For Fire Tree, um, they're asking for no rate increases. For Clearbrook, they are asking for rate increases in their short term rehab of $16 a day, and for Detox, $17 a day. In the last fiscal year, we didn't actually send anybody there, um, but we do like to have a number of providers just in case we have someone that we need to send there. Uh, Cadenzia, they're asking for rate increases. $8 for detox, 11 for rehab, nine for co-occurring. Um, they're asking for long-term rehab of $7 a day female halfway house of $16 a day. Um, women with children at their one facility, they're asking for a $12 increase in their other facility for women with children, they're not asking for an increase. Um, and then finally, Roxbury, their inpatient <coughs> treatment contract, they're asking for a $10 increase for detox and for rehab and a $12 a day for co-occurring clients. And then Roxbury's outpatient contract, um, they would have the same rates as what um, had been approved, uh, I think, at your last meeting um, for some of the other outpatient providers. We do the same rates for all providers for that. Any questions? Yeah. Ryan, when, when there are changes in the rates, you gave us numbers. Are those numbers the new rates or are they the additions to the old rates? Um, the numbers I gave were additions to the old rates. Right. At some point, send us an email, please, with what the original rates were so that we would know if that's a big or a little increase. I, um, you don't have to give it to us now, but you, you could send us the email. I, I think that was actually included. That's okay. If you could just send it again. Okay. That okay. Be, thank you. Yeah. It's important that we know what the effect is to the county when these new races come through. We'll continue to ask and also give them that information. Well, so I, I assume there's a reason, but um, you know, the, the budget situation in Harrisburg last year, why, why is there a difference between 
uh, approving of these contracts July 1, 26 through 18 through June 30, 2017. In other words, for the next fiscal year, but we had a situation with children and youth um, where we're approving contracts for what happened. Um, is there a difference between how the different state departments operate? Is that the issue? Or? Yes. Um, for the Drug and Alcohol Commissions, it's the home county of, of the provider. Um, so the provider sends all of their documentation to the home county. The home county goes through, um, looks at the rate increase, and they decide whether or not there should be one. And then that goes out. Um, and so we do that in the beginning of uh, May, late April. Yeah, but my, my, I guess my question has to do along the lines of what Commissioner Keith Lippo asked. Um, you know, is the budget was held up for what, nine months uh, for everybody, uh, for all of them. So I guess what's the difference? I mean, this, is this under the Department of Drug <coughs> Correct. Yes. Okay. As opposed to the Department of Human Services. I guess that's the difference. That's the answer. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Sylvia? Uh, Hi. Uh, these are two health choices contracts, so not specific to drug and alcohol, but to mental health and drug and alcohol. Uh, the first is a uh, comprehensive management service agreement with Community Behavioral Health Care Network of Pennsylvania doing business as Perform Care. Perform Care serves as our day to day uh, managed care organization for our behavioral health and health choices program. <coughs> and this comprehensive management service agreement maintains a direct contactual relationship with Cumberland, Dolphin, Lebanon, Lancaster, and Perry County who is the collaborative that we operate under other health choices and also serves as the vehicle for unifying all five counties into a single uh, collaborative unit. State and federal funding for the behavioral health health choices program is provided through the Pennsylvania Department of Human Services. All five counties in our collaborative currently have contracts with the Department of Human Services for the provision of health choices services. Um, this two-year renewal agreement will correspond to the next two years of our contract with the Department of Human Services for the provision of health choices, behavioral health services. And um, that also has a one-year extension so that uh, the two years will be covered. Okay? So it's two years with a one-year extension. The new management service agreement uh, strengths the certification and licensure that establishes minimum criteria around incentive uh, payments. And the uh, Department of Human Service developed a new performance uh, measure relating to connected or integration between physical health and behavioral health. <clears throat> so that is part of this as well, as well as a new non-compete clause um, as part of this agreement. As with all health choices matters, our legal counsel for the collaborative Lawrence Tabas uh, has negotiated this contract with Perform Care, and I know has sent a letter uh, saying that he would uh, recommend that the five counties sign a contract for uh, Perform Care, the um, Comprehensive Management Service Agreement for Perform Care. Any questions on that? Uh, the second is related to a renewal of a county administrative agreement with Capital Area Behavioral Health Collaborative. The Capital Area Behavioral Health Collaborative is the nonprofit cor corporation formed <coughs> by Cumberland, Perry, Dolph, Eleven, and Lancaster uh, to coordinate our regional health choices efforts and manage our uh, health choices program. It also provides the required risk coverage um, for health choices. Um, the current contract between the counties and CABHC run through June 30, 2016. Complete funding for this health choices program is provided by the Pennsylvania Department of Human Services. No, no county general fund uh, monies. Our current health choices agreement runs through June 30th of 2019. And 
uh, in order to continue with the Health Choices Program, we are requesting a three-year contract with CABHC to continue with Health Choices. Are there any questions for Sylvia? Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you, Ryan. Um, next, I want to call on Paula Sherman to discuss the agreement between Human Resources and U.S. Health Works Medical Group of Pennsylvania, PC, and then Paula. Good morning, Commissioners. Um, this addendum is to add the line item or service of chest x-rays to our contract with US Health Works for our employees for the purpose of TB testing. It's a flat no increase in those contract service. Sorry, I'll repeat that again. It's for what? It's for uh, to perform chest x-rays for our employees for screenings and testing for tuberculosis. We do TB testing at our prison and our nursing home for employees. And I'm sorry, why are we doing it? Why is this for everybody who's no. for pre employment? No, it's they do the typical two day TV test, and if they don't pass that, then they have to have a chest x ray done. The US Health Works has always provided the contract that was signed in April. This line item was left out of the contract inadvertently, so they're adding it. The right, but it's, is, it, is it just for the prison and nursing home employees? It's available to all employees, but we are required by the state for the prison and nursing home employees. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I'd like to call on Darren Beige to discuss the agreement with the IMTO and CenturyLink. Darren? Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, I'm here asking for the approval of a one year extension to the CenturyLink agreement that we have. This provides a dedicated fiber connection with the courthouse to see the work IP addresses. Any questions for Karen? Is it at the same rate? Yeah, same rate. Okay. Uh, 
multiple clients or multiple? Multiple clients, multiple therapists providing to the multiple clients. So, uh, so is the cost driver the number of clients or the number of therapists, the number of clients? Number of clients in this. So it would be safe to assume that uh, Sylvia has a lot more clients than... Shannon Sweeney right above her? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, and so right in the middle, you'll see something there for the Office of Child Development and Early Learning, which is our Infant, Toddlers, and Families Medicaid Waiver Operating Agreement, which is an agreement between the state and the county that outlines the duties and responsibilities that we have and that they have in administering the ITF waiver, the Infant, Toddler, and Families Waiver. Um, that's, that's like right in the middle of all those contracts. Mm -hmm. Any costs associated with No, no costs. Just the outlining responsibilities and duties. So that's all the early event, early intervention ones. And for the intellectual and developmental disabilities, Susquehanna software for technical support and software software services. This is the software that we use to extract data from the state databases for both early intervention and intellectual disabilities so that we can build medical assistance for our sports coordination services. <clears throat> so this is so our computer to talk to their computer? Yes. Into, and put it back into other tasks within the project. 
So we're not looking at any increased cost for the project. It's simply moving money around within the existing project. Okay. Okay, the last piece then is the Northwest Southern Railway Company uh, agreement. Uh, this one has been forwarded to our solicitor to review and was back and forth with uh, Depot Southern. We are working on any bridge in South Middleton Township to access the bridge to need a uh, temporary construction easement from Norfolk Southern. So that kicks us into their review and approval process. There's a 36 page agreement that our solicitor looked at. Uh, there's an anticipated cost of up to $28,000 uh, from Norfolk Southern that we could be responsible for. They have their uh, engineering departments review our construction documents, uh, our preliminary engineering documents, and also provide flagging services uh, while our folks are out there to make sure that we have safety uh, to the site. So we're, we're looking at doing this project next year, so we're ahead of the game here, but uh, working with the railroad here does take time, and I think we have an agreement that our our solicitor has reviewed and is okay with and looking for approval on that. Any observations on that? There is more back from me than forth from them, which is pretty typical of dealing with the railroad, but I think I have it as best as we can get it. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Kirk? Thank you, Kirk. Thanks, Kirk. Yeah. Next up, Paul and Justin Miller are also joining us via video teleconferencing to discuss the two grants for recycling and waste. Justin? Good morning, Commissioner. Can you hear me? Yes, Justin. Okay. Um, for the 902 grant, last fall, the Board of Commissioners approved submitting an application to the state for a Section 902 recycling grant for the purchase of a new leaf turner for our yard waste. Uh, equipment recycling program. Uh, it's recently announced that the application has been selected for an award and the state has sent us what is called an official grant offering agreement which is what I'm asking you uh, to sign. After both parties sign it, we have two years to complete the scope of work and then seek 90% reimbursement for the project cost. 10% match is required and that will come from the monies that we collect from the municipalities uh, to replace the equipment. My plan with your approvals along the way, obviously, would be to make a purchase in 2017. Total project cost is $266,000 or for $266,451. The maximum DEP share is $239,805 and the match would be $26,646. Hey, Justin, for those of us who aren't familiar with this, just could you briefly explain what a leaf turner is? Yeah, the uh, leaf turner is a piece of equipment um, that turns leaves that municipalities collect in the fall. They generally form them in the road, and this machine uh, goes down the windrow, fluffs them up, and helps the decomposition process. All those things. It's part of the uh, okay. It's part of our organic recycling program. Thank you. Okay, uh, 904 grant, <clears throat> 904 grants reward municipalities and counties money based on total tons recycled in a calendar year. Uh, at the beginning of every year, I request recycling reports from followers that operate within the county. Most of those are municipal specific and I forward those to municipalities to use in their 904 grant. But we do get some that are um, county-wide uh, data reports. I use those to complete a county application. Um, and I'm estimating based on their formula that we would receive $16,616 for this application. And that award probably would not occur until 2017. But we have to get the application in by September 30th. Hey Justin, question on that. Those are, so those are still awarded based on the tonnage that, that goes through the, the system, right? Do, Correct. There, my guess is that a lot of the municipalities are still seeing uh, a lot of potentially eligible material being diverted off and, and not making it into that particular stream. Do we have a, any ongoing education effort to let people know how, 
how much actually is eligible for that? Because that would sort of drive our our uh, and the municipalities uh, financial awards up. Yeah, actually, I, um, I work pretty closely with municipalities uh, on that. They're obviously very interested in this because it's a financial reward. Um, and they're always looking for ways to improve their programs. The big thing that's been happening over the last couple of years is a movement towards what's called single stream recycling, larger recycling bins, trying to uh, capture more material. And so that's, you see that? coming here or it, it's been happening um uh um silver spring township just recently went to larger bin um south middleton township uh their new contract they went to a larger bin um but a lot of what's driving that is this 904 grant because uh, they're obviously very interested in you know the financial incentive so the separation actually takes place by the the baller or the uh so there yeah. All right, so there was no longer separation. Then that's why everything today in this area is collected all mixed together, and then the uh, collector does all the separation um, back at their facilities. Right. What's interesting, if you look at this grant application, um, if the whole if the company you get the reports from does not give you what's called a residue rate, and that is material that it's pulled out of the recyclables that should have been in there in the first place yeah. you have to use an automatic 15 percent reduction wow okay. justin uh on this if and i'm trying to recall but is this the grant that uh, municipalities are not necessarily receiving what they would if the program were fully funded by the legislature in other words is this the grant where they get a percentage of what they should be receiving yeah that, that, that's a good question Jim um, a couple years ago I say four or five years ago they altered their formula by um, you calculate what you normally would have got and then you take an automatic 40 percent reduction and that's because it's funded by the state's two dollar per ton tipping fee which has been in place since 1988. But that's, the argument is that fee has never been adjusted for inflation, um, and the money that it generates is not adequate today to fund all the uh, grant applications. 1988, it might be a little outdated. Yeah. 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 yeah, and I, and so, I mean, I think Gary's right. It, it, it is based on tonnage that's recycled, uh, but essentially, you know, it's not necessarily funded, uh, fully funded as it, as it was intended to be. So, a lot of other things in the, you know, the state budget that aren't adequately funded, too. And this is one of those areas. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Okay, thank you, Sandy. Moving on to item number 11, Lynette, um, uh, uh, complete with hand signals up there. We have a discuss, uh, discussion of the Highmark sequestrian issue. Uh, yes, as we discussed on Monday at the uh, CNRC board meeting, um, we now need to have commissioner direction as to how uh, Claremont would like to, uh, to proceed on the Highmark sequestration arbitration. Um, as we talked on Monday, if we proceed from here into phase one, we would be incurring a flat fee of $2,500. Um, and if it actually went to arbitration, uh, then you know we would have arbitration costs as well and a percentage of the recoup on the uh, potential sequestration that they held in, um, without meeting the contract requirements. And Lynette, are so we, we basically need to go ahead. No, you go ahead. We just basically need to have um, it to, to have the determination or the discussion of what the commissioners would like us to do 
as far as should we proceed with phase one or should we not continue and pull our pull out of the agreement or not out of the agreement but out of the process and Lynette we don't need to do that today we can do that on Tuesday so Monday is fine to, to make that determination and they communicate that back here so that we can communicate with the link first we may not have a quorum yeah, quorum would be tough to pull together on Monday, but Tuesday would uh, gladly do it Tuesday. I'm sorry. Tuesday. Yeah, sorry. Tuesday. 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 That's a <laughs> any, any questions for one day? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving on to item number 10, discussions of capital project requests. Before we get started, um, I'd like everybody who's presenting to please present the amount. Um, and going forward, for anybody who's listening for any capital project requests, we will be publishing the amount, or the anticipated amount, or the range for the capital project requests when they're brought before the commission. So, without further ado, I will call on Melissa Calvinelli from the Courtroom Administ Administration, Audio System Consulting, and Design Services to four and five. $25,000. Thank you. Um, this is actually, and I'm not quite sure how the solicitor's office does it, this is sort of an extension. I think we're doing it as a new contract, but it's kind of an extension of the previous contract we had with Acoustical, um, the Acoustical Company to do the design and evaluation of the courtrooms for the audiovisual upgrades. Um, because of some delays with the system and some problems we developed with courtroom one, um, we need a little bit more money for the design phase and everything to finish courtrooms four and five. Um, so this is just an extension of that for the design. This is not to purchase the audiovisual. That will go out for bid. This is the designer who does the evaluation and acoustical analysis in the courtroom and comes up with a plan that goes out to bid. That would be an extension. It's sort of, yeah. I, I think I put new on here, but I, I put... Yeah. All right, so that is an extension of the existing contract with the same provider that we've been yes. using throughout this project. Yeah. yeah. And this is for additional services. To finish the final two programs, yes. In the sum of 25. Yes. Thank you very much. Any questions from Melissa? Yeah, I just would like to ask a question. You indicated that this was this additional cost is related to a delay of courtroom one. What was the reason for the delay? There was actually some problems with the way this is not I hate to say problems because it's not like the vendor's fault or it, it was a combination of factors. There was some miscommunication and it caused some issues with the way the system was designed. We're coordinating with IMTO, the designer, the judge, myself, and, and I think there were some issues that got miscommunicated in that we had to pull together and have a day kind of help the project and move forward and it just created some problems and now we're moving forward to kind of fix those issues have mostly been resolved. We're still working on a few technical issues, but I, I don't know that the blame lies with anybody. I hate to say problems. It's a large computer technical project, and there was some miscommunications. So the specifications were not correctly uh, communicated to the vendor? Not. I go ahead. They were communicated to the vendor, however, they were communicated by someone who may not have completely understood the impact of the requested changes. Okay. Right, so, go forward and over to have a little better project yes. in the process. Yes. Yeah. So. Yes. They've been more clear with the, the, unfortunately, the vendor took direction from someone who they thought had authority they know, to give them. They should know who is yes. specification. That was clarified quite clearly to the vendor and, and that resolved some of the issues. Should have been provided in writing to them, so. I'd rather explain why that we That's fine. Sure. That's fine. <laughs> I'm not looking to, you know, single it, but yeah, things do happen, but we just want to avoid it happening in the future. Yes, yes. It's clearly a breakdown in process. Yes, so there, there was. And well, I mean, it's a twenty-five thousand dollar additional cost to the county so it's for some delay for some reason that we don't know, and I'm certainly not happy about that. 
I, I'm not even trusting that. All right, so we can collect this information and have it in front of the commission before they make a decision on this yeah. on Tuesday. I'll let, I'll let you know. Thank you. Any other questions for Melissa? All right, Kurt. Planning Department Sample Bridge, Silver Street Township. We're having a drive-by firing here. Are you okay? Let me do that again. The uh, estimated cost for the bridge project uh, is six point one million dollars. If we were successful in the multimodal fund application, uh, our share of that is 30%. If not, the share of that would be 100% uh, minus the, the, the share from the, the township, which I believe is around $250,000. Other questions for Kurt? Kurt, the um, Cumberland Valley School District there been any talks with them you know the school new schools going to be just down the road from that bridge i don't even know if it's been approved yet through the township the final plan but is there ever any, you know any discussion about the school district possibly assisting out with the cost of that bridge replacement that, that's a good question vince we notified them of our modern motor fund project they actually submitted a letter of support for that Okay. They've never offered up any funding for our project, uh, but they did, the Carmel Valley School District did come to Hats and apply for a transportation alternative grant for a, a tunnel under one of the roads, I think Valley High, up there where the new two school complex will be. So, uh, no, we haven't had any offer for money from them, but I did see another instance where they were coming back looking for other public money for their project. Yeah, okay, thanks. And Kirk, could you repeat that in terms of the uh, the grant, uh, the multimodal grant, and how much that would recover would cover? And then, how how are our prospects look on that? I know you mentioned it before. Yeah, sure. The multimodal fund will cover seventy percent of the project costs, uh, and our prospects right now are unsure. We're aware that the initial decisions for the <coughs> are likely in the governor's office. But we're not sure when we'll hear final word on whether or not we're successful. I do know there were over 250 applications for that amount of money. Okay. So best case scenario, we're in this for about 1.8 million. That would be 30% roughly. And worst case scenario, we've been in for the whole thing. That's correct. And in terms of the funds to pay for that, under either scenario, this would come from mostly our $5 registration fee revenues. That's correct. We have five dollar registration fee, you know, we have savings and liquid fuels. As we discussed with the board earlier this year, you know, when we look at our bridge capital improvement program, there's some cash flow issues that may come up. And this is a project we're monitoring very closely that when we're not successful in the multimodal fund, we may be working with finance to come back with a proposal of how to cash flow this project and potentially reimburse with the five dollar registration fee. Okay, so I suspect we'll be hearing about this on an ongoing basis. That's correct. This is, a, this is a big project. You know, clearly $6 million is nothing to, to sneeze at, but at the same time, this bridge has its issues. Uh, there's some other issues out there with the alignment now. We're seeing it being hit on a regular basis uh, in accidents. So it's something that we, we don't want to push down the road and need to take care of now. All right. And uh, I'm going to ask Dana a question. Dana, do you anticipate that this is going to have an impact on the general fund to any significant degree? If, if we do the financing, Good. I do not think it will impact the general fund because we're able to reimburse. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Any other questions for Kirk on this project? <laughs> thank you, Kirk. Now our good friends Brian and Claudia from Public Safety, the 911 emergency phone system. Good morning, everybody. Uh, sorry we couldn't plan that motion uh, for our presentation, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Leave it up to us, right? Um, this project uh, in total for the first year will cost $857,344. Um, and then 
year two through five on the maintenance contract will be a reoccurring 137 154. Um, this system replaces the 901 phone system that we use today. Uh, it's been oper in operation since October of 2011. Uh, currently working on a Windows XP platform. Uh, so back in April of 2014, Microsoft discontinued support for that platform, uh, therefore causing CenturyLink, the phone system vendor, uh, to let us know that they're not going to, you know, uh, maintenance the system any longer uh, past October of this year. Um, so with that, we uh, we needed to do something. Now, while we have a project in process, they will maintain a month-to-month -month, uh, maintenance for us as long as we have it uh, in contract. Um, with the recent changes of the 901 funding and regionalization that uh, FEMA would like to see across the Commonwealth, we did explore three different options as was discussed uh, at the finance meeting back on the <coughs> Those three uh, options were a standalone format, a shared system, with Cumberland and York, I'm sorry, Cumberland and Lebanon, and then the final option was the shared system between Cumberland, York, and Lebanon, all three. And as the pricing uh, pinned out over five years, um, and with the recommendation that we heard from, <coughs> excuse me, you all on the finance meeting was to go with the standalone option at this point. While we were trying to look at a shared system, uh, the numbers don't lie and actually would have cost us a little more to do the shared system. Now moving forward, we look, would like to, uh, in the next five years, take a look at uh, sharing again in hopes that networks and funding streams will be better in place to help support that effort. Um, the cost comparisons showed uh, there would be initial savings of the equipment, However, the reoccurring cost over the five years is uh, what will exceed the savings. Uh, when you do shared systems, there's a little more maintenance cost, as well as now you need to do connectivity between those different points. And that connectivity is expensive because it has to be very reliable for obvious reasons. Um, and as well as, you know, the more you divide things up, there is a level of uncertainty uh, and possibly more points of failure. Um, all, all of this, again, in the next five years, when we have to revisit this again, uh, we hope we'll have a little better plan uh, for what the funding streams are and connectivity. As far as the not one uniform funding, um, this does fall into the 15%, uh, but it is the lowest priority. So while we We'll try and submit. There's no guarantee that we'll get uh, any, any assistance from 15%. Now, the project as a total is is uh, eligible for uh, the uniform surcharge, so we'll, we'll still see a little bit of uh, return on that. And just to be um, to, to repeat, that's 857 344 for the first year and then 137, 154 for four or five years after. Here, I'll bring it down differently for you. Uh, the initial cost, non-reoccurring, is 720, 190. All right, then, then the reoccurring maintenance is 137, 154 total for the five years. Okay. All right. So that 857 figure uh, included the first year's maintenance? Yes. Thank you. Any questions for Brian and Claudia? All right. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Thank you. And now, our colleagues from the coroner's office, thank you very much for waiting patiently. We have a Ferno body transport litter and loading system. Uh, total cost is $36,000, uh, $18,000 we would like out of the general fund, $18,000 out of our F-122 fund. Uh, this motorized cart will assist us in doing the removals of all sizes of the individuals with, without, with, with reducing the strain of the employees. 
Uh, the, the car is motorized, so it will go over dirty barriers, it will climb steps, uh, and it'll, it'll, instead of us manually lifting them, we, the motor can assist us up with them. Most other corners departments for counties our size have uh, apparatus like this? Um, Lycoming County has two of them. Um, Perry County has one. I think Juniata County has one. I'm not sure about York or Dolphin. Uh, Franklin County, I believe, has one. Uh, so they're starting to become more common throughout the counties in the state to assist because uh, anymore now, it's, they're getting bigger and bigger and bigger and they're heavier and heavier to lift. So right now, you, you do? You we do the manual lifting, yeah. Any questions on this? I have one question. I don't really expect you to know the answer to this, though. So um, at one point, the commissioners were questioning why so many deputies were being called to the scene um, on any given call, how many, and how many were on call. And the, the reason we were given was you had at least two people in the body. Yeah. So now we're finding the cannabis solution. So does that change to any of the other underlying assumptions? As far as I know, that, that, that's, that everything's still two, two deputies per case. I mean, I. I, I, I mean, I can't I'll direct, I'll answer that yet. Yeah. We'll, 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 we'll direct any other questions yeah. on that to the appropriate individuals. I just want to ask if you have any other Any other questions? Thank you, sir. All right, we're going to move on to item number 13. And again, waiting patiently. Thank you, Rebecca. Commercial Revitalization and Shop Study Loan Program Application regarding the work. Graywater um, Ops located at 321 Bridge Street in Covenant. Good morning. This is going to sound familiar to, uh, to some of you. Our new commissioner wasn't here for the earlier presentation, so this might be uh, new to him. Graywater Ops owner Bill Zutel bought this property in the fall of 2014 and opened his business there a month later. Then in January, he had leased the top shop to the loft eatery named in the same year, the Patriot News for today, Penline.com's best breakfast pick. Both of those units had been vacant for over three years. So that was very good news for the Cumberland Borough. So Tell is a spirited and high-flying character. He is a commercial pilot and a member of the Pennsylvania Air National Guard, an entrepreneur. During our first presentation, he was at 30,000 feet. Today, he is a uh, on assignment and underground in Florida, uh, but this request is for $35,000 for a loan for new equipment. With me today is Keith Henshaw. Keith is the COO of Greywater Ops, and I do a lot of work with him. They are a business that makes military challenge coins and commemoratives and other novelties, as well as for other organizations. They're <coughs> athletic teams, the uh, fire department, social clubs, Organ school organizations and the like. They imprint apparel and other gear, t-shirts and the like. They do an increasing amount of fundraising um, to help worthy projects, everything from fire trucks to forestry and park projects, uh, all types of things. And they do that for local, these local organizations like I mentioned and many national organizations too that you're familiar with like the American Red Cross, we're very proud of the work that they do with the Gary Sinise Foundation. And you hear a lot about that during the Memorial Day weekend, the PBS special, this coming weekend, the 4th of July, Veterans Day. They work with them year round. And last year, I'm uh, very pleased to tell you that they contributed over $10,000 to the Gary Sinise Foundation. That's pretty commendable. The Great Water Ops moved from Harrisburg to Old Town, the business in Pennsylvania's fastest growing county added four new jobs at that location. This $35,000 loan for new equipment will enable them to uh, expand on site and with their auto press, they'll be able to at least quadruple, depending on what kind of work they're doing, but do a whole lot more shirts and a lot of other things at this location. Zutel will put another $26,000 of his own money into this project. The CDBD shop setting loan will be secured by a property he owns in Harrisburg, which is his resident residence. It also has some apartments in that building. 
at 2841 North Front Street will have liens on the equipment and his personal guarantee. The county would be in the second lien position behind members' first federal credit unit, and the loan to value is 85.6%. That's what well within our guidelines. Zutel expects to um, fulfill the re job creation requirement immediately with the landing of the equipment. I am proud as a pyrotechnic technician on the 4th of July weekend to tell you that um, he has quadrupled his job creation requirement with the first one. We'll, of course, do that with the second one. And he has paid well ahead. Oh, my legs are. But, but he's paid well ahead on this one. And um, he opens early, he stays late, and re he refreshes the gigantic windows in the, in the you know, front of the building all the time with lots of uh, their products. Remember, window shopping, that's a challenge in our downtowns. We like to see people's products and people in those windows. Great Water Off supports our community, has been a great addition to the downtown and a very good neighbor. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you have about the business and this All-American investment opportunity. Questions? Thank you very much. Let's move on to item number 14. Uh, Kirk Stoner, uh, discussion and approval of motion to designate Kirk Stoner as the local project manager for all local sponsor county bridge projects who will have the authority to speak for and bind Cumberland County in all matters relating to the contract including the approval of work orders. Is there a crown of that or something? All right. <laughs> <laughs> Does he get a special badge? Not a crown. I think the commissioners for uh, each of our federal uh, aid projects that we're working on right now, that includes Craighead Bridge, Wolf Bridge, and Horse Bridge. When we get to the construction phase of the project, we need to designate a local project manager in Cumberland County. And we need to put that in a letter back to PennDOT also indicating our consultant staff will be looking at the construction inspection and oversight uh, for the project. Uh, we've not made it, we've indicated that HRG as our county bridge engineer will serve as the construction inspection. They wanted a local project sponsor, or project manager also indicated that letter. So uh, I showed this with Keith, we had some discussion on it. Uh, you know, I think that this is my role on a daily basis. Obviously, the, the piece that we want to look at is you know, our talks about uh, me having the authority to speak for Cumberland County, uh, you know, contracts, binding language, things like that. I think the intent is that I would be the local point of contact for this, and we follow our traditional channels for any contract-related issues, and we bring that back to the board and get approval on it. Um, again, as you said, Gary, I'm not giving a crown here and any authority. I learned a long time. I have not. So, uh, you know, we'll continue to work with you guys following standard processes. So, so, Kurt, uh, I, I think my issue here is, as this is written and out of the context which you have provided, I wouldn't give this permission to my mother. And I actually, I would trust you more than my mother, frankly. Um, but as written here, there's, it, there's, it, it sort of, it reads like carte blanche, and I know that's not your intention. Um, but I'm wondering if, um, you know, I, I know when we had the discussion about the uh, change orders for the contracts for stuff that John, Walk and yourself are managing, clearly we don't want to hold things up, but there were limitations, overall limitations, that were specified that allowed the both of you to operate within a certain context, and if you went needed beyond that, then you came back to the commissioners. So I'm wondering, is there anything that would just be prudent to even, and this, it would work both ways for, for your protection and the county's uh, protection, either, and I'm going to defer to Keith on this, either as a sidebar or something else. Um, and again, this does not question your intent whatsoever. It's just, if you take this out of context and read it, it reads like card, sort of like card launch, especially the thing that talks about binding the county in all matters relating to the contract. I, I, I agree. I, mean, I have no problem with the letter being sent designating her, but as you've done previously, one financial matters, and again, in this case, there should be financial matters, uh, project extensions, things like that. I think it's a good idea to have parameters and recognize that in a resolution. Right. So, caps on the dollar amounts. 
specific time. authority uh, that deals with contract uh, schedules and things like that. And there's some others I'm sure we'll come up with that to confirm. Okay. So those, those limits would be developed. It'll be among the three of us. I will document them in the resolution. And that's probably the best way to do that because you will approve it in a public meeting and use a record. Is this something we could possibly do on Tuesday? Or do we need more time? Kirk, how much, what's the time? I, I think you need this relatively soon. Yeah, we do. We want to get everything in. We're just waiting on one permit from me. If we get that with the Treasurer of bidding the project. Uh, the other issue I could do here too, uh, Commissioners Larry Keith, is modify the text of this letter. You know, it's stock text from PennDOT. You know, I didn't write this letter. It's just stock text from PennDOT. We can modify the text of that letter to indicate that I can act in that uh, capacity only under the uh, approval and review of it in the county commissioners. There's no, I think that's a good idea. There's no problem sending the letter immediately as modified as he suggested, but we do need to follow the resolution. I don't necessarily believe it has to be done Tuesday in terms of the resolution, but it must be done. The resolution would just be more our internal use of mm -hmm. and not so exactly. we can take care of the and not part right. on, on that basis. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And again, I, I think these things, just like the change order stuff, you want these things to move with, you know, uh, quickly and efficiently without having needless holdups. And so the, the concept is great. This is, I think, a detail that we would move forward with the letter and we'll work together to cover resolution to the commissioners as soon as that's possible. So the letter could be ready for Tuesday? Yes. Okay. Kirk, if you could change that letter and get it to yeah. me, at least in Larry. Yeah, and we'll sort of do that. Do you have Yeah, I think it's important we can follow up with the resolution. But I also think that, Kirk, you should get a certificate that says Local project manager underneath it says, "Around here has a very responsible position. Anything goes wrong, and I'm responsible." I haven't totally dismissed the idea of a crown. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm thinking. I'm thinking. I'm thinking. All right, Kurt. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Um, next, I'm going to call on uh, Warden Earl Rice uh, regarding acceptance of by the county's prison the donation of the server. Yeah. One server or two? I think two. Two servers to the prison from the uh, company GTO. Just a little history once again. Um, GTO uh, pro provides order to make telephone uh, system at the jail, and they also uh, uh, provide us with our offender management system. It's a database where we keep all the inmate records. Uh, we're in the second year of a five-year agreement with them. Part of that agreement was um, um, updating our offender management system for the inter internet-based system. Um, since we've entered into that agreement, the FCC came out with rules and regulations regarding uh, what inmates can be charged uh, for their phone calls, um, in, in dialogue with, with, with GTL, um, the commissioners and the prison board, you know, opted um, to um, go along with what the FCC uh, was recommending with regard to phone um, rates. Uh, and I was kind of putting some leverage on, on GTL um, to get some things with regard to our upgrade for offender management system. Uh, our offender management system runs off an Oracle um, server. We are the last Oracle server in the county. Uh, IMTO would like to tr uh, transition that to SQL servers, uh, and GTL has offered to do that at no cost to come the county. And uh, Earl, what's the approximate value? About $16,000, I'm told. Uh, so we're, we're just asking for permission to allow uh, GTL to, to, to do that for us. I think this is in accordance with policy on this. Correct. Acceptance by the commissioners. 
Okay, are there any questions for Earl on this? Okay. Thank, Thank you, Earl. Thank you. And now it's time for the commissioners and the ACE report to start off with the chairman's approval. I have nothing to report for this. So All right, so then therefore there are no questions. Uh, <laughs> Commissioner Hartzell. Okay. Uh, I'll be relatively brief. The County's Housing and Redevelopment Authority boards met Thursday, June 16, and uh, took a series of mostly uh, administrative actions. Uh, Tim Whalen will become the new executive director of the Housing and Redevelopment Authority uh, on uh, July 25. Uh, I did inform the board that soon thereafter the county will be uh, spearheading a discussion to more uh, clearly define uh, with an agreement of understanding uh, the roles of both the Housing and Redevelopment Authority and the Cumberland Area Economic Development Corporation. Uh, to avert any misunderstandings and to ensure that both entities are working in a collaborative, efficient, and seamless fashion in promoting economic development, redevelopment, and the housing interests uh, of the county. Uh, the Aging Advisory Board met Friday, uh, June 17, recommended our approval, which we have already acted upon of a new four-year area agency on aging plan as required by the state. I'm also pleased to report that Branch Creek Place is the recipient of an additional state grant in the amount of $32,600 uh, to finish some renovation work at the New Shippensburg Area Senior Citizen Center. Uh, Branch Creek was one of only 43 senior centers statewide to receive funding from this latest round of, of state grants from the state lottery. The, uh, the board also recommended our appointment um, uh, a lady by the name of Donna Fiebig, uh, 107 Laurel Drive, Enola, Pennsylvania, uh, to fill a, a, a vacancy uh, on the advisory board uh, with the term of that vacancy expiring at the end of this year. Um, and what I would like to do is pass that information on to my colleagues for their consideration at their uh, meeting on Tuesday to fill that vacancy. Um, the uh, Capital Region Council of Governments met Monday evening, uh, June 20. Uh, there was a presentation from Bruce Crowell from Congressman Barletta's office and from Mark Smith, uh, the Director of Government Affairs and Outreach for Governor Wolf. It was reported that a total of 11 municipalities and the COG had now followed our lead in adopting resolutions urging the installation of safety median barriers on Interstate 81 to prevent crossover crashes, and that nine municipalities have joined us in adopting resolutions urging the state legislature to establish a citizen's commission for the drawing of state legislative and congressional district boundaries following the next census. Uh, I did report to the Council of Government members uh, Cumberland County's efforts to achieve transit agency administrative consolidation in the interest of saving local taxpayer costs and improving transit service for our respective constituents uh, throughout the region. And that's all I have. Any questions or comments for Commissioner Hudson? Uh, just one thing, Jim. The, uh, the Council of Governments, did they announce the option dates? Because that's typically Yeah, the and I, uh, they did, and I don't have that handy, but okay. I'm happy to share that with you. I was going to say that, you know, a lot of municipalities attended. I don't know if we still send anybody to the Chicago pre-make event. Sending someone, that's not a bad idea because there may be items that we could potentially. Those are you know, familiar with it. It's a surplus equipment yeah. option. And the, even though there's a lot of private buyers coming by, the, the things that the school districts as well as the municipalities are, are trying to divest, uh, a lot of municipalities end up buying from each other. They find all kinds of yeah. bargains and so it's a money saving opportunity as well. It's, so, a great, it's a great place to get a. Uh, 
get a bicycle cheap. <laughs> if, you need, if you need a bicycle, they have dozens upon dozens of bicycles that they acquire at the municipal level. Well, the auction, what usually happens is, yeah, somebody comes in and buys them all. You know, but uh, it's open to the public, and you know, so it is, it is something that I, I just, I'm sorry, I don't have the date. Yeah, it's very large. Yeah, okay, we just pass that along to John. So mm -hmm. he's, 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 yeah, I'm looking for an inexpensive backhoe. Inexpensive what? Backhoe. Backhoe. Is that worth checking out? Mm -hmm. okay. All right. Um, Commissioner Eichelberg. Yeah, just a couple of items. I wanted to mention I was at the, uh, in keeping with our, our uh, recognitions that we're doing uh, to outstanding citizens who helped out during the uh, blizzard in January. I was in Newville the other night to uh, present a certificate to Jim Schuster. And uh, I want to say it was, it was uh, that in itself was very nice. They were extremely appreciative and uh, uh, commended us for Taking the time as well to recognize the you know, great community participant there uh, who helped, helped out by donating equipment. Uh, I also want to mention that the um, uh, borough manager Fred Potzer had reminded the, the council members about the uh, tremendous benefits that the boroughs enjoyed through the grant of CDBG money uh, for the that they put toward the renovation of their, their public park in town. Which, of course, those of you who live in, in town know that public parks in town play an extremely important role. And they were extremely grateful that uh, for that and actually gave us a round of applause. And I certainly mentioned that I would pass that along uh, to the Housing and Redevelopment Authority, which makes the, the recommendations as well as, as uh, you folks. But that, that means a great deal to them, and they really went out of their way to make sure that we were uh, uh, aware of how much they appreciate that. And what, Meaningful role in place for the town. The, um, we also got a, just for informational purposes, at the end, we did get a lot of questions. Bob Scheidman was there as well. Bob and I got a lot of uh, questions in regards to the rollout of new emergency communications network over the next few years, which we've had some discussion of here. There's been some publicity about. And um, I think that's going to be something we're going to hear a lot more of as we go forward. And there were a lot of long memories there that remember how disruptive the rollout 15, 16 years ago was when the, the 800 megahertz was introduced. So um, a lot of interest by them in ensuring that they get information. I showed them that we, our plan is to engage municipal partners very extensively. And I gave them a little reminder about our municipal advisory board because I did know they have been present for a little while. Mm -hmm. uh, so gentle reminder. Uh, but I just wanted to pass that along. It's, it's very clearly on their minds, and it got, when uh, the council president brought it up, it clearly got the attention of the, of the members. And for a borough, especially the size of Newville, the significant, uh, significance of the cost and impact would be kind of tough to overstate. So uh, I think this is something we're all aware of and we're, we're going to stay engaged in it. But it's worth noting that in the past episode, I can say the municipal partners were not we're not really part of the process, and this reiterates to me that you really need to be extremely cognizant that uh, their their impacts are huge in this, and we need to maintain them as part of the, the process, even though it's a very long process. There's a long way to go, and there were questions raised about the, the current warranties and such. And luckily, you know, having Bob Shively there he was able to answer their questions and find the so thank you, we're very pleased. And, uh, uh, I just wanted to let you all know about that. So um, very quickly on some of these other items, I think Justin kind of covered the waterfront here with the, the grant information on recycling. Um, I do have the latest activity report, which I'm going to pass along to you. However, it's in black and white, but my charts are a little tough to do. So I'll get you a color copy. The one point I wanted to mention is they continue to receive a large number of phone calls at the office, and they are they are centered on uh, household hazardous waste, which is sort of an ongoing uh, issue for them. Because people don't know how to dispose of a lot of household items, but the TVs and electronics continue to really 
generate a great number of flaws to them, the, the lack of an outlet for doing recycling. There was a lot of discussion at the meeting regarding the um, essentially the failure of the RFP to identify a solution to a vendor. And uh, I did pass along a little bit of information to you both already. And uh, Justin would like some feedback on some of the ideas, particularly uh, whether the county should essentially divert some of its main partnerships money into doing a drop off event as a stopgap until we find something permanent. And also, uh, we were asked to consider the idea that maybe the time has arrived for the county to start thinking about a, a permanent facility that would be uh, supported by fees from uh, consumers who are, who are uh, paying essentially to, to get rid of their equipment. We know there's been a lot of resistance to that in the past, uh, but the market is changing and uh, our options are very limited. So um, just to ask for feedback from all three of us to go back and, uh, directly to him. And I, I believe that's already been done, actually, but I just wanted to remind you about that. Um, the only other thing I wanted to mention, I think we both received a copy, it was an incident report file regarding some damage done to uh, some of the yard waste equipment. And uh, they will need our, our uh, buy-in for some of the, the decisions to be made there regarding the assessing of costs and maybe refining the agreement with the municipalities to ensure that uh, uh, the agreements are being met and people have the proper training and those things. So, uh, uh, so I asked Justin to set up a briefing to you. If you haven't read it yet, please you know, make sure you take a glance at that. It's very important. So, uh, just real quick on the MHID side, or to mention, we had, we had our speaker at the meeting, uh, Linda Levins from Community College who spoke on the post-secondary education issue uh, for uh, citizens with uh, IED uh, challenges. And they actually have a brochure I'm happy to display here that uh, career bridges at HACC connecting students with developmental disability to a career. And HACC is now offering a certificate program uh, both in culinary, for culinary specialists and also for nurses' aid training. Um, and they have uh, students, some students involved and in, enrolled already, and hopefully we're going to be expanding that program. Obviously, the goal here is to expand employment opportunities for others with IED. And, uh, we've seen a number of schools adopting similar for credit and not for credit programs, and we're hoping that's something that expands. This is why it's gives some detailed accounting, and I do have some handouts on that for anybody who's interested as well see and knowing how that's going on. I had mentioned at the last meeting about the county's participation in the suicide prevention initiative. We hear a lot about, uh, of course, the opioid uh, addictions uh, challenges that are sweeping the country and uh, maybe the suicide issue, which does follow that. We know a substantial uptick in suicide, incidents of suicide. And it's, I think it's kind of got pushed off the headlines by the opioid issue, unfortunately. So HIDD is participating in this Pulse program. Uh, and it was a community in May. It was a community uh, kickoff event. Megan Silverstrom from our communications team uh, uh, emceed that or moderated uh, And uh, this is a grassroots effort to try to improve education on strategies and resources that the community can use to address uh, the suicide issue. I do have some some uh, informational materials on, both on the training and also an awareness poster that uh, uh, I'd like to see us put on display here as well. If we have any other outlets, these can be available, be available to public information on this is a, is a very important step. So uh, appreciate if we can participate in that uh, somewhat. The, I think most of the other things are already addressed. I just did want to mention that the, the group was briefed on the Senate Bill 1279 uh, regarding the suspension of medical assistance uh, benefits for those who are incarcerated. And there are apparently 14 states now who suspend. And uh, Senator Vance introduced this bill. The board commissioner says already posted support in writing for that. Uh, so uh, the group was briefed on that. And I think that's all I have. Sue, since you're here, do you want to uh, give us anything else on that? Um, I, don't, I don't think I have 
Okay, yeah, I'm looking at your report and uh, not their things there. But, but yeah. They're sort of uh, day to day stuff. So, okay, well, I think that's really my head. Anybody have any questions? Okay, thank you, commissioners. Uh, item 17, I'd like to report the following executive sessions June 22nd, 2016 at 1 p.m., June 22nd, 2016 at 2.35 p.m., and June 29th, 2016 at 10.30 a.m., all three regarding personnel issues. And June 22nd, 2016 at 3 p.m., and June 24th, 2016 at 9.30 a.m. regarding litigation issues. Also, I can request an executive session uh, today for personnel issues. Is there any other business? Hearing none, we are adjourned. Thank you very much.